okay okay i'm recording lou's talk and i urge everyone else to mute themselves okay over to you lou okay i'll start just a moment there okay you should be able to see this Right. So uh, I'm titling this talk. Oops, sorry. I realize I had better put it in full screen mode rather than the other. There. Um, I titled this talk Virtual Kirby Calculus um, in respect of uh, it's the first of three talks uh, by, my, by myself and then AG and then Heather. And um, and we are uh, going to be looking at uh, invariance of three manifolds obtained by doing surgery uh, in such a way that it can we can apply virtual knot theory to uh, to uh, find the quantum invariance of these three manifolds. Uh, so, in order to do that, uh, I need to. We need as background work the temporally libre coupling theory for the Witten Reshetik and Turayev invariance. And so, what this talk is for the mostly is a description of how to do written Reshetik and Turayev invariance uh, by using the bracket polynomial and the temporally libre algebra. That is, it is a description of the work that you will find in the book by Kaufman and Linz entitled something similar, Temper the Lieb Recoupling Theory and Invariance of Three Manifolds. And then at the end, I'll say a few words about virtual knot theory, and then it will be over to A.G. and Heather for further work as we do this series of talks. So... Uh, so I so this is going to start with the bracket polynomial, and we will end up in the Witten Reshetik and Turayev invariant. Uh, and some of this you may already know, uh, but if you don't or you haven't thought about it in a long time, then I intend to draw uh, a clear line through this kind of machinery and show you how it works. So this is meant to be a guide for uh for you it's it should be enough uh in and of itself but if you wanted more technical details or how to calculate actual formulas for things then you can look at the our book or related papers so let's go we'll recall the bracket polynomial in its expansion like this and um and how this is uh this notation is based on the idea that you would draw a little glyph and it means a larger link diagram that contains that so that these and these are the same larger diagram except that the site indicated and that there's a polynomial associated with the link and loops take a specific value and this ends up being invariant under the second and third Reitermeister moves. I'd also like you to recall the diagrammatic temporally leave algebra, which is generated by um, these little boxes, the identity and the UIs, and, uh, and there are relations. The relations are that UI squared is delta UI, UI, UI plus or minus one is UI, and they commute when they're farther apart, multiplied like braids, plugging top of box into bottom of box. And these glyphs here indicate why these relations are true, as you can see. Recall also the Art and Braid group. And the Art and Braid group is generated by elementary braids and has and can be described as the group with relations, uh, the braiding relation, and that they commute when they're far apart. And then we have 
in this framework a representation of the braid group to the temporally leave algebra, which takes one to one and takes the ith braid just like the bracket, smoothing the crossing in the braid horizontally uh, to get a UI and vertically to get the identity and multiplied by A and A inverse. So this is just like the bracket, but instead of being an evaluation into loops, it's uh, an evaluation into a, uh, a particular element of the temporally Lieb algebra and a product of braids goes to the corresponding product of those elements. And you can check uh, that this is a representation of the braid group to the temporally Lieb algebra. This is, in fact, a version of Jones's original representation of the braid group to the temporally Lieb algebra. And we have, um, using the diagrammatic temporally Lieb algebra, we have a trace function. It's not a matrix trace. It's a generalized kind of trace function from the temporally Lieb algebra to the ring ZAA inverse. The, with a very simple definition in this context. The definition is that the trace of a product element, a product of UIs, uh, is equal to the bracket polynomial evaluated on the closure of that product. Illustrated here, here's a product of U1 and U2 in TL3. Um, and the closure is the same as the braid closure, you take the top of the of the box and you add, and you identify it with the bottom of the box by a series of parallel lines, and um, then you get a loop. You get uh, just loops, and the bracket polynomial evaluated on those loops is delta to one minus the number of loops. In this case, there are two loops, as you can see. So. This gives uh, a trace function in the sense that the trace of, of the product of two things is equal to the reverse product, trace of their reverse product, trace of xy is equal to trace of yx, and other properties of trace that one would want. And so um, this is our version of the trace. Um, Jones defined a trace on the temporally Lieb algebra which in which in his form, format is done by uh, taking the combinatorics of the normal forms of the words in the temporally Lieb algebra. It's not done by diagrammatics. The diagrammatics weren't there at the time when he made that uh, construction. But we nevertheless have this situation. Here is the Jones representation of the temporally Lieb algebra. Here is this bracket trace. And if you compose them, you get a mapping from braids into, into the Laurent polynomials. The bracket polynomial of the closure of the braid is equal to the trace of rho. Um, so this is the context in which I'm working with the temporally Lieb algebra and the bracket. This is, of course, indeed, um, uh, a, an expression of how the bracket polynomial is related to the temporally Lieb algebra that is essentially the same as how the Jones polynomial is related to the temporally Lieb algebra once you translate bracket and Jones and understand that Jones's tra combinatorial trace, combinatorial algebraic trace, is the same as this loop counting trace. And then we need certain elements in the temporally Lieb algebra, the Jones-Wenzel projectors. Now the Jones-Wenzel projector is an element in the PN, in the nth temporally Lieb algebra, the temporally Lieb algebra on n strands. And it has the form of being the identity plus a certain sum of coefficients times products of the UIs. Uh, we'll see. And it has the properties that determine it. Its square is equal to itself. As I said, it's a projector. And if you multiply by ui on either side, you get zero. So diagrammatically, pn can be represented by a box. And 
if you stick two of them together, it's the same as one of them. And if you would compose it with a UI somewhere, it will vanish. So if you wanted to stop listening to this talk and do some work with the Temple Leap algebra, you could go off and try to figure out uh, how to write formulas for these, but I'm going to tell you. So if n is equal to 2, what I have drawn in the box at the top of this slide is P2. There's P2 right there. It's two parallel lines minus 1 over delta times the turn times U1. It's 1 minus 1 over delta times U1. And you could verify that directly just to see that it does indeed work. If I multiply the box by itself, that means I expand the upper line, uh, the upper one, um, and then I still have the lower one, and I have to expand the lower one, and I expand all of them, and I look and I find, because of the fact that when I expand twice, this product here times itself gives rise to a loop, and that loop is delta, um, that causes a cancellation, and you end up back at P. There you are. And, uh, and on the other hand, if you were to multiply this gadget by um, a U, uh, why then you see again that if you multiply by u, you would get a delta in the middle, and so um, and so you get one over delta multiplied by delta cancels, and you get u, the u minus u that's zero. So so if all you wanted to do was two strand work, you wouldn't need any more than this Jones Wenzel projector, but we need n strand work. And for n greater than 2, the projectors are constructed by induction. This is Wenzel's definition. As you see, you have n plus 2 strands going into the box. You segregate a left strand, and, uh, and then you have an n plus 1 projector. And on the other hand, you can uh, segregate two strands, and uh, then by definition, it is this diagrammatic composition that you see here with one and one meaning specific strands and this is an n-fold strand and there's a coefficient which is a ratio of Chebyshev polynomials which are defined by delta naught is one delta one is delta and delta n plus one is delta delta n minus delta n minus one um that's an inductive definition which uh, you can have some fun with to find out what the rest of them look like and to show that indeed they do work. They satisfy the axioms I told you. On the other hand, it's interesting to understand that there's another way to think about this. And um, there is a formula like this. I hope you don't mind. Uh, uh, it may feel like I'm going to talk forever about the Jones-Wenzel projector, but we do need them. So we're just dwelling on them for a few minutes. This is a nice formula, which comes from the analogy uh, of what we're about to do with the Penrose spin network theory. If you look at this crosswise, and let a be equal to say minus one, then you see a familiar sort of sum, a sum over permutations, Sn is the symmetric group on n letters. And then it would be minus one to the number of transpositions in sigma, which sigma is a permutation. So that's the sign of the permutation multiplied by, uh, well, if a was minus one, it wouldn't matter. Uh, and sigma and sigma hat would be the same. But what sigma hat is, is it's the lift of the permutation thought of as crossing lines. You can represent a permutation by a braid diagram where uh, the lines that cross are just indicating permutations. But you lift such a permutation diagram to make a braid out of it by uh, taking crossings so that all the horizontal smoothings of the crossings are of A type. That's sigma hat. But you see, if you looked at this vaguely, it would be the sum over permutations minus one to the T of sigma times the permutation divided by N factorial. And that's a kind of 
anti-symmetrizer formula that is natural in algebra and natural in representation theory. And this is a lifted or deformed uh, symmetrizer formula. Uh, and, um, and in particular, for the n factorial, you take the sum over the elements of the symmetric group of a to the minus four to the t of sigma. t of sigma, as I said, is the number of transpositions needed to uh, make the uh, permutation, and it's the minimal number. And this is a generalized or q-deformed factorial. One says q, but in this case, it's a. That's the Q, and um, and that's a braid formula for the PN, which relates it back to uh, the sort of constructions that occur in the original kind of theory, which is involved with SU2. And what this theory is related to is SU2 deformed, the quantum group. But I'm not going into the quantum group side. I just wanted to indicate that connection. So just so you see that uh, this really does work, let's take the case n equals 2 and look at it again. Here's quantum factorial 2, which was a to the minus 4 to the 0 plus a to the minus 4 to the 1, which is 1 plus a to the minus 4. Now, what about 1 over quantum 2 factorial times that funny sum? Well, the funny sum is just two terms. One has an a to the minus 3 to the 0 power, since there are no transpositions. And the next one has, one, has it to the first power. And so we get uh, 1 times parallel lines plus a to the minus 3 times braiding. And now you see what I meant implicitly. Implicitly, you're applying the representation row to the break group. So this gets expanded a la bracket into A smoothing and A inverse smoothing. And you expand it out and collect the terms and you get one plus A to the minus four and A to the minus two times the turnaround. And it's divided by the factorial. And once you divide by the factorial, you get a unit times the identity minus one over two times the U2, U1. And there's P2 again. And this works in general. So this is a, the interesting thing about this, if you like to think about projectors in the temporary leave algebra, is that this is a global uh, formula for the Jones-Wenzel projector instead of having it by induction. And you can have some fun with this. Um, we also need trivalent vertices. And a trivalent vertex, to extend the knot theory so that there will be trivalent vertices in the theory, um, and a trivalent vertex consists of A parallel lines, B parallel lines, and C parallel lines all meeting together at a vertex. And this happens and turns into actual knot theory, actual um, weaving, um, by uh, sharing out the A lines into I and J, the B lines into J and K, and the C lines into I and K, and forming this connector like this. This also it has its relatives in representation theory, where the projector is actually projecting to an irreducible representation of the quantum group. I'm just saying these words to give you the context of that, but everything we do can be just done with the combinatorics I'm presenting. Um, the uh, what we this um, gadget represents algebraically is taking the tensor product of two representations and projecting it to a third using the projector technology to do this. As for the sharing, well, you need I plus J is A, J plus K is B, and I plus K is C. And you will notice that if you take A plus B, you get 2j i plus k, and if you subtracted c, you'd get 2j. So you need, in fact, that a plus b minus c is greater than or equal to zero and even, and cyclically for the other choices, b plus c minus a and c plus a minus b. And this is the, then you can say what you need to have a vertex without talking about the individual way that you share. You can solve for the sharing uh, from this, and this is equivalent to having the sharing. So for example, up here 
in the top of the slide on the right, you see some ways of setting up vertices in the two strand case. You can have two, two, and two. You can have two, two, and zero. Um, you can have two, two, and four. Um, and in the original Penrose spin network theory, where A is equal to minus one, these correspond to interactions of particles, particles being irreducible representations of SU2, um, uh, of spin, A halves, B halves, and C halves, respectively. A halves, C halves, not C over C. So we have trivalent vertices, and we're going to do knot theory in the extended world of these trivalent vertices. And whenever you are actually computing with the vertex, it is then expanded into a, a big sum of things by the projectors that are its definition. And now we have colored Jones polynomials. And colored Jones polynomials are done as follows. You take your knot k and you replace it by an n fold cabling of k um, with a projector in it. And then you take the bracket polynomial of that. So we have the n bracket of k is by definition the bracket polynomial of the n fold cabling of k with a projector in it. So for example, the two fold colored bracket is obtained by taking the two-fold cabling of the knot, the trefoil knot in this case, with a projector in it. Now, if you're following this and you've seen that two-fold projector, you realize this is nothing more than uh, the bracket polynomial of the ordinary two-fold cabling where the projector expands to parallel lines. And then the turnaround part in this case is very simple. It's, uh, it just simplifies and gives you some consequence. That's the way it works in two strands. But when you go up to higher strands, you're going to be getting a sum of the standard cabling bracket plus a sum of all sorts of other things that have to do with sub pieces of the cable. Uh, where you have the turnarounds in the temporally lieb algebra. A big complicated formula, more complicated than just cabling the knot. But that is by, or by definition, the colored bracket polynomial. And as I said, if you follow the analogies with the algebra, this corresponds to an irreducible representation. And this corresponds to labeling the knot with an irreducible representation of the quantum group. Um, now, why, why are we doing this to you? The reason we're doing this to you is because if you just did cabling, you get a very impossible to compute kind of combinatorics. Uh, for example, a threefold crossing, uh, like the, a, a crossing of threefold strands will give you nine individual crossings to expand. And that's two to the ninth terms in just the expansion of that. Um, and um, all sorts of uh, nitty gritty combinatorics to calculate the bracket if you looked inside. So the point of this theory is to enable us to calculate these things without ever looking inside. And this is accomplished in this category of trivalent graphs. It's accomplished because one can write a formula like the one I have here on the slide. I am using the notation that we adopted in the book with Linz. Um, I, I have here a coefficient, which is written A, B, C, D, I, J. And the A, B, C, and D have to do with the number of lines, uh, the, the lines coming in on the four corners of this object here, which consists in two vertices joined together by an edge, which is labeled J. And as you see, I go cyclically around from bottom left A, B, C, D, and put it in this little box A, B, C, D. The J is down and the I comes from the other side. And this is the recoupling formula. Changing in a trivalent graph an edge from being written this way to being written this way is what I call recoupling an edge at the graph. 
It also corresponds to reassociating in another categorical way of thinking about it, which I didn't mention in these slides. But you can take a trivalent graph and you can recouple an edge. Now you can simplify trivalent graphs by recoupling them. And that is the key to how the calculations are going to happen externally rather than internally. And this recoupling formula depends on these 6J coefficients, called 6J because there are indices in them like J and 6 because there are six indices, of course. Um, and the existence of this formula is often thought of in terms of representation theory. Here, the existence is a certain change of basis in the temporally Lieb algebra. You interpret what is being said in terms of temporally Lieb algebra and the projectors, and you prove by direct combinatorial reasoning, not too hard, you could find it in the book with Linz, that this formula exists and there must be these coefficients, and this works. And you can further check that there is a certain single coefficient um, which uh, tells you what happens if there's a bit of braiding near a vertex. Very important for all sorts of applications. A bit of braiding near a vertex multiplies by a certain thing depending on all three indices for the vertex and like that. So, so this is the key and I'm going to dwell for a few minutes on how you might get at these coefficients given that you believe that they existed. I'm not going to dwell on how they exist, but as I say, it's uh, not hard. It's just in the temporally lead context, you just take the definitions I gave you and look at them and see what it is that they're saying and see that indeed it's possible to write rewrite this in terms of this by choosing the right bases. And there's another good formula, this loop bubble formula, it says that if you have a little loop like this, a little bubble, and you have a C coming in and a D coming out, then in order for this to be non-zero, you need C equal D. And then the coefficient of it is that it the bubble disappears and, uh, and you can just have a single projector line at C. C has to be equal to D. And theta of ABC divided by delta C, where theta is the value of this particular little ABC net uh, labeling a theta graph. Now that turns out, you can calculate that. You can, there's actually some formula for that. Um, uh, of course there is, it's just the bracket polynomial of this network. But, you know, there's a formula that's articulatable in terms of quantum factorials and so on, and I won't exhibit it. But if you wanted to find out why it's that coefficient, given that you believe that there is such a formula, then you can just close top and bottom and, and determine what it was. You see, it's consistent with that. Close the top and the bottom, and then you just have C on the left-hand side, if that's okay, because... C has to be equal to D here anyway. And you close this and you get this closure of a projector. Now I didn't mention the closure of a projector that is taking the top line into the bottom line and evaluating the bracket polynomial of that guy. Uh, that's the Chebyshev polynomial. You might try it for N equals two and you'll see it worked at that level of Delta. Okay, so here's the Chebyshev polynomial. Here's the theta graph. And here's the theta graph divided by the Chebyshev polynomial. So these cancel, and that says this is indeed the theta graph. So this is how you find out that uh, what the coefficient is for this basic expansion. So then you see between this recoupling formula and that bubble formula, if you were looking at a graph, you could recouple the graph until you had simplified it into bubbles and then evaluate the bubbles and you would have evaluated the graph. So that's why it's possible to calculate anything once you have it in the graph recoupling form. Now, what about the other formula? The other formula said that this guy here in the middle is equal to this sum of these guys, and I'm going to close it. 
And I close it by taking these lines and drawing a circle with a dot in the middle so that B comes up to a trivalent vertex and C comes up to a trivalent vertex. And similarly down in the bottom, and then I connect them with a K that goes from here to here. Now, if I do that on the other side, I get this closure. This closure has bubbles in it and can be resolved out, as I said. And the K is going to, for, remember our formula said delta Ki. So I has, K has to be equal to I. And the sum, it's an orthogonality. The, th the sum just drops into one term. So I get the following formula. I get that this tetrahedral net, which is what I've drawn, it's a, it is the planar diagram of a tetrahedron. Um, this tetrahedral net is equal to the 6J coefficient multiplied by this bubble thing. And the bubble thing will expand out. What happens? You take this out and it becomes theta divided by delta. And then you're left with the other one. You see, you take this one out, it becomes theta BCI divided by delta I by definition of what happened to the bubble here. And then what's left is another one, theta ADI. So we get the tetrahedron is equal to 6J times product of two thetas divided by delta. Or in other words, 6J equals tetrahedron times delta divided by product of two thetas. So now you have to calculate a form, you need a formula for the tetrahedral net as well. And one finds a specific formula involving many quantum factorials for the tetrahedral net. And these two basic nets, the tetrahedral net and the theta net and the Chebyshev polynomials then become the basic evaluations that need to be known in order to evaluate anything. So that's the way this machinery works. Now, what about a crossing? So, We're going to get, hello? Yeah, Lou, um, I'm just wondering, um, uh, you did mention that you need all these quantum factorials. And uh, isn't there a lot of nastiness that's involved in computing those those specific things, the 6J symbols and, and the theta nets? Well, as I said, there, um, there is a, a formula which looks like a certain sum of certain products of quantum factorials divided by other quantum factorials. It yeah. isn't nasty to a computer. Ah, okay. That's a good answer. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, that's all I can say about it, right? And, and of course, you can wonder whether uh, you know something about them. Uh, uh, for example, in the case of, say, you take something like the Kashaev conjecture, and it is, the, which is telling you that under certain circumstances, colored Jones polynomials are calculating volumes of certain three manifolds in the hyperbolic sense of the volume in the limit of something. And then those formulas, if you were to write them in this theory, are big concatenations of evaluations of tetrahedral nets. And the tetrahedral nets are related to the triangulation of the manifold and so on. But those conjectures become very impenetrable from just direct calculation uh, to understand because of the complexity, combinatorial complexity of these formulas and, and not fully understanding their limiting behaviors. So, so yeah, there's something complicated concentrated in them. But as, but as having a formula, there is a formula. So if you, I think that answered the question too many times, yeah. Okay, so what about crossings? Well, here's a crossing. And you see, I can interpret the crossing as a, as a crossing living above a zero connector between these two, because you could label zero and zero means no lines. And then you have B into B and a zero coming out, right? And that's a perfectly good uh, interaction. That's the one I illustrated back a slide or two. I just want you to not get confused by that. But this is the two, two, zero vertex, you see? And two into the, and this is just the line two because, the, because of the projector. 
the projector squared is equal to a projector. So this is just a two line with a with one of its projectors doubled. And then you're looking at a two to zero vertex. Yeah. So you can have uh, an AA zero vertex or a BB zero vertex, and you can regard that as this. And then according to the recoupling formula, this guy BBAA with a zero in between expands into connections going the other way and running over all the different possibilities for those connections. And then you have a particular 6J BBAAI zero and now you have a, a twist up at the top of a vertex, and we said that that would multiply by a lambda ABI. So you see, we have a formula for the crossing, an arbitrary crossing with A lines and B lines, um, uh, as a sum over graphical nodes, doubled graphical nodes like that. And that means that if you put down your link and you want to calculate its colored Jones polynomial, its colored bracket polynomial, you expand all the crossings into nodes. <clears throat> and then you have a, a sum over trivalent graphs to evaluate. And then you apply the recoupling theory and simplify the graphs. And voila, you have a formula for the colored Jones polynomial with all the complexity hidden in the networks that got evaluated. Now, what about this coefficient? Ah, let's go back and find it. Well, the general coefficient was given by this formula. And so I had BBAAI zero. And if you look carefully, you see that that decorated the tetrahedron with BBAA, a zero in the middle, and the I over here, and the delta I. And then we had theta ABI, and then we had theta ABI. The two thetas are equal. Oh, but look at the tetrahedron. It's missing an edge. And B is equal to B, and A is equal to A, and I up here. So that's a theta ABI. So a theta canceled, and we have delta I over theta ABI. So we have this is the beautiful formula for the crossing. It's a sum over i or delta i over theta abi, lambda ab over i, times the recoupled guys. Anything can be beautiful if you live with it long enough, apparently. There's our formula. And what happens if you have two parallel lines? Well, I leave it to you to check uh, that this gives this by the same token. It's just there's no crossing there. Um, and, um, and, and this is also very nice to have. This says that if I have a parallel line A and a B, then I can couple them together. And then I have these coefficients like that. So now let's recall Kirby calculus. And I'll come back to this uh, recoupling theory in a moment. So recurbing calculus can be formulated by a blackboard framing, by which I mean that I will not write framing numbers on my links. I just have little curls. So this is a one framed circle, and this is a minus one framed circle. And the first move in Kirby calculus is that they can be brought up or thrown away at will, one framed circles. The second move in Kirby calculus is that if you have a, a link component and, and you bring it up near another link component, then you can handle slide this link component over the other one, by which I mean you take the two cabling of this, no twisting, just parallel cable, and take its connected sum with L. So that L kind of slid all the way over the other component. These are two moves to add to the framed Reitermeister moves. Framed Reitermeister moves, of course, are that um, you don't use the first Reitermeister move, but you use the second and third, and you keep track of the first ones up to, up to framing equivalents. So you have um, a generalized knot theory with two extra moves in it, and two moves are Kirby equivalent in that knot theory, if and only if 
the corresponding three manifolds obtained by surgery on the links are homeomorphic. That's Kirby's theorem. So you can think of handling three manifolds by handling diagrams of links in blackboard framing up to Kirby equivalents. And so if we want an invariant of three manifolds, we want to construct something that is invariant under the Kirby moves. And as you see, this could be some kind of normalization if you knew what the value was for plus and minus framed one frame circles. And this could present a problem of certainly the ordinary Jones polynomial is not invariant under handle slide. So the strategy in this combinatorial theory is the following. We will, we wish to get from here to here, from before the handle slide till after the handle slide. And we will think of doing it this way, that I will bring uh, an, a bit of knot diagram up to the other knot diagram, and then I will couple them. There's a formula for that, we have it. Then I will use the invariance under Reitermeister moves generalized in the graph category, which I didn't tell you, but you can slide that point around. You can do Reitermeister three moves that pull the uh, pull an interval underneath the graphical vertex back and forth. There are moves that are true, and you can just slide that point along. And when you do, you generate almost generate the two cable of the knot diagram and you'd slide it along until they meet somewhere else over here on the right and then you decouple them and you end up with the handle slid entity now of course things are going to change their evaluations when you do this but if you take the right summation of things we're going to get something that doesn't change its evaluation and i wanted to show you exactly how that happens so we're going to define omega on a line, a line labeled by omega or starring the line with omega to be the sum on J of delta J, Chebyshev polynomial times the line with a I projector on it. So it's an I line, I parallel lines with a projector on it. So that means that if you were to omega a trefoil knot, it would be the sum over all the different multiplicities of parallel of parallel cables times the Chebyshev polynomials. And for each parallel cabling, you would have a projector on it. So this is a big sum of knots, all evaluated by the bracket when you finally stop evaluating. So then we have the follow, we can note the following that happens that if you take an, a simple A line and uh, an omega labeled knot and you calculate uh, what happened, you'll see that it's equal to the result of handle sliding. Let's see how this works. So by the way, you might be wondering, what am I summing over? In the case of doing these invariants, you we need, um, at least at the outset, you can do variations on this. You take a root of unity and you sum over roots of unity uh over j's that correspond to roots of unity so this is a finite j it's not the sum over all possible j's it's the sum over a bounded set of j's all of them from zero on out so now given that there is a sum like that let's see what happens we um we have that by definition this is the sum over i delta i of an i labeled line an i labeled line has a projector on it and we can apply our theory then these the a and the i are neighbors and they couple and there's a coupling formula so we couple them and then we have the sum over j for each of the i's of delta j over theta a i j and it's coupled but now it's coupled with an a coming in here an a coming in here and a j in here and the rest of it is labeled i around the knot and now you push the vertices around the knot until they meet on the other side and now uh and now uh you find yourself with a knot which is cabled almost 
and the I is in the middle of the cabling and the J's are on the outside part. And the A, J and the A are on the outside part. And now you uncouple, you uncouple by saying, well, um, I can rewrite this as a sum on J of delta I's, uh, a, a sum on J of delta I over theta AIJ. See, delta I and delta J come in symmetrically. We needed that formula that we derived. And here we are. Now it's a sum on J's of delta J, uh, and it's coupled, uh, it's decoupled, and um, and I have the handle slid version, but now when I get rid of the sum, the component is still labeled omega. And so I accomplish the, for these formulas say that the evaluation of this is equal to the evaluation of that. So this is the analog in our combinatorial theory of if you sum over all the representations in this range, um, for the colored Jones polynomials, if you sum in the right way, you will get something that's invariant under handle sliding. And this is specifically how handle sliding invariance works here. And this tells us that we this tells us that we can produce a theory of uh, three manifold invariance or or Kirby calculus invariant invariance by uh, labeling all of the components of the knot with omega, which I call omega star k, and then it has to be normalized, and it's normalized in this way, that you take the bracket of omega star k, and then you have to multiply to handle the first Kirby move. And it turns out that if you take mu to be equal to this trigonometric function, and you take mu to the number of components plus one, and then you take alpha to be equal to mu lambda one, and here's another evaluation that's needed. You need the evaluation of the Kirby bit. This is the one-framed surgery bit with an omega on it, so you have to evaluate that. Um, and then you take alpha to the minus n of k, and n of k is the nullity of a linking matrix associated with the link. And that normalizes the invariant in such a way that the three sphere gets a mu and the S2 cross S1 gets one. And this is uh, this is the bracket uh, polynomial temporally Lieb algebra way of writing down the Witten Rashitik and Turayev invariant. This works for if you're thinking quantum groups, this works for the SQ2Q quantum group, it works for the one that works for the bracket. And we don't at this stage have such a nice recoupling theory for the other classical groups. Uh, so they also can be uh, framed in terms of, um, of doing the representations of the quantum group for the other quantum groups. And, and you can study the Witten, Reshetik, and Turayev invariants for many different uh, uh, choices. But this, is, this one has a complete combinatorial story which is what I've told you. And this complete combinatorial story, of course, has a lot of calculational possibilities under its hood and, um, and a lot of opacity as well to questions you might ask it because of its purely combinatorial nature. Not enough to just stay with the combinatorics to understand everything for sure. Um, but what I wanted to do in this talk is give you a tour uh, and a kind of place to look if you wanted to see how this works, because we'll, we will be using it. And because it is natural to ask, how do you generalize this to virtual knot theory? And Heather Dye's thesis is all about this. And Heather and I wrote a paper about it, which you can easily find on the archive, in which we calculated a lot of examples. In fact, um, in fact, almost everything generalizes. Um, um, you, I remind you that in virtual knot theory, you add a virtual crossing and a detour move that says that virtual crossings can be rerouted any way you please. And we use virtual knot theory in the sense of taking framed blackboard virtuals. You don't have standard Reitermeister one, 
but otherwise you do the rerouting in the usual way. And, and then you can begin to see that there will be difficulties. For example, there will be other thetas. There will be thetas like the one I've drawn here, where that circle is means that those two lines, that C line and the B line, which are bundles of lines, cross each other virtually. And, uh, and uh, because of those kind of other thetas, uh, the base calculations may have to be repeated uh, in some other forms in order to finally calculate things. But, but the base description of the theory, all the way up through making things that are invariant under Kirby calculus sliding, that all works. And that means that you could draw a virtual diagram and imagine that you were calculating an invariant of a three manifold associated to it. But then the question is, what three manifold? Well, that is the project that we're now going to be telling you a little more about because you see, if you have a virtual knot, then you can think of that virtual knot, whoops, you can think of that virtual knot as having a corresponding embedding in a thickened surface. It has embeddings in many thickened surfaces, and it does have an embedding in a least genus thickened surface. You can think of making those embeddings in various ways. For example, one way to make an embedding in a thickened surface is to um, is to put a, a, a handle on the plane that routes, routes you up through and back to the other side of the handle, uh, a one handle um, that avoids the virtual crossing and then the diagram is embedded in the surface. Uh, and there are other more efficient ways of putting, di of putting virtual knots into surfaces. But once the, ver once the knot has been represented in some surface cross I, then you could do surgery on that knot in the surface cross I. And then you might like to know about the invariance of that three manifold with boundary, or you might want to add boundary to it. And you would like to relate uh, those three manifolds and their quantum invariance with the virtual calculation that I've indicated to you that is possible for a virtual Wittenrich Tekin Tariyev invariant. And so the rest of our project has to do with, um, with an insight uh, of ages that we can use a paper by Justin Roberts to do to handle how to do surgery in those thickened surfaces. And then the theory there is a little more complicated, but it is possible to normalize the surgery. And once the surgery is normalized, it can be referred back to the surgery theory uh, and the handle sliding theory and the Kirby calculus for virtual knots, and thereby by to a recoupling theory, and thereby to calculate invariance of actual three manifolds instead of uh, just formally working with the virtual diagrams. So that's the program for the next lecture. And Heather will be talking about some of our calculations that we will have. So this is enough for one talk, I imagine, and we'll stop here. Well, thank you, Lou. Uh, fascinating talk. Um, any questions? Yes, I'll be staying at this time. No. No, we go back to the normal. It's just that America moves uh, a week slower than us. Oh, right. So, <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, I have a couple of questions, and I'm glad you're there, Colin, because, um, well, one question uh, would be, I should have asked when you were talking, when you talked about the minimum number of... Um, uh, uh, Transpositions. Transpositions. Do you mean the actual, it's not mod two, it's just the actual number. No, um, yeah, I mean the actual minimal number because you see the, it went from minus one to A. Yeah. So it's no longer, it's a, that generalized sign of the permutation has, yeah. has to know how many uh, crossings there really were. The other question was that some time ago, Colin and I wrote a paper uh, in which we, localize the Kirby moves. Um, 
Now, I'm not sure. I mean, maybe that would simplify your calculations. Um, you know, you, the slide, the handle slide is a is a. Oh, uh, yeah, you mean uh, I know what you mean. Yeah. Right. Uh, and sometimes that actually is uh, we've used that. Oh, we yeah. have used that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. In in understanding, for example, in understanding things like give an example of two manifolds that have the same invariant and, yeah. and things like that. OK. Yeah. 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 No, your formulation is very, very important. Very beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. I, <laughs> <laughs> that's that's that makes me feel good. <laughs> It's all to remember it, Rog. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Uh -huh. If you don't worry about the first Kirby move where you remove uh, unframed uh, components, do you still get something meaningful top topologically? Well, you'd be looking, let's see. Uh oh, well. You know, you really, uh, one thing is you want to keep track of four manifolds as well as three manifolds. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and, and you can. Kirby calculus applies to classifying four manifolds. But then, of course, you added a CP2 uh, to the corresponding four manifold that, uh, that uh, where you were doing the, the surgery in terms of um, cobordisms. So, yes. Okay. Yes, it's meaningful if you go up to the four manifold context. Okay. Could could you still have a three manifold invariant without the without worrying about the unknot? I mean, I know you have this extra information about this four manifold. Well, well, I mean, when I have the doing surgery on a one frame circle doesn't change the three manifold. Right. Okay. But um, but there is an extra CP two going on at the four manifold level. So so. Depends on what it is you're tracking. Okay. Okay. Right, thanks. There are a lot of good expositions of curvy calculus uh, applied to four manifolds, as you know, books by Gomp and books by Kirby and so on, and um, and also a paper from a long time ago by uh, by a student of um, of one of you, um, probably uh, Cesar de Sa. Oh, right. Yeah. There's a yeah. there's a nice paper from a long time ago that I, I like that paper because it's only ten pages long and it summarizes a lot. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Well, I have a fun project for somebody. So you have um, these either in the quantum case or the classical case, you have these six J symbols that are given by factorials. And if you look at the mod two, I would reckon that they're fractal. Or in the quantum case, you can color them with, with quantum integers. There ought to be some really pretty fractals that are given by both the quantum six J symbols and the Clevish Gordon coefficient. How, how, how are you making something geometric that you're calling a fractal? Oh, so you consider it as um, living inside the six, six simplex. So, I mean, you, you have all these, um, uh, uh, so for example, the multinomial coefficients are, uh, are the analogs of the Sierpinski triangle in, in an N simplex. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And so these things uh, should exhibit some very nice fractal natures, and they may wind up being um, uh, just Sierpinski gadgets, but they ought to be pretty, very pretty, and um, they ought to be fun to look at. I'm sure. That you're, you've never programmed the computer to do, do them, or you've done some? No, I, I just got to be too lazy. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I was worried about typographical mistakes and so forth. In that in that arena, there's a, a, a problem that I keep meaning to go back to. Roger Penrose's six J symbols in his case, which is A equals minus one. Um, yeah. they're all counting formulas. 
you're counting the way certain circuits in the network behave and right. adding up. Uh, uh, and the and there would appear to be uh, some counting reinterpretation that ought to exist for the general case. Right. I mean, it has exactly the same form, only you're using quantum factorials. So the question is, what is the right way to generalize counting so that those formulas still are counting formulas? Yeah. And that would be related to the kind of patterns that you get. The patterns right. that you get are related to that counting right. situation. Uh, hmm. okay. Can I uh, ask uh, some questions? When you refer to the six symbol, do you mean something, something recursive in nature, like uh, saying, binomial um, formula uh, with the coefficients. Is, is, that the, is that what you meant that they could all be calculated, that there is some sort of induction work? Well, yeah, the, the 6J symbol has a formula like a, a sort of, sort of a, um, a big brother to the, um, to the binomial coefficient kind of formula this factorial divided by some that factorial right okay and there will so, and, and there are there are going to be recursion formulas for them of various sorts yes okay. so when Scott, in our work we mostly just took them as here they are here's this factorial formula which we derived for it and we use it but in, to get the factorial formula and prove it we in fact were working recursively Okay, so then just a second ago when you mentioned uh, um, that you're seeking for a sort of counting interpretation uh, to prove a formula that's proved uh, by computational means, like seeing it as two different ways of counting the same thing and saying, oh, they should come out equal by uh, because they are counting the same thing only differently, kind of argument. Well, I, I mean, it's it is analogous to what happens in 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 ordinary uh, choice coefficients, right? You have a formula n factorial over r factorial times n minus r factorial is choose n r, um, and yet on the other hand. You have recursion formulas that tell you about how to think of them in terms of counting choices. Yeah. Right. So you can say it has to do with counting choices. And Roger Penrose noticed in his theory, which is this theory just just sort of collapsed to, to standard factorials, if you like. He noticed that his 6J coefficients could be uh, obtained by counting certain loops in the network okay. and if you want to see one exposition of that you'll find it in our book the book by kaufman and Linz, and okay. and a reference to wherever we found it in his papers i don't remember which paper of his explains that counting it might be in the famous one on applications of negative dimensional tensors If you haven't seen that paper, that's worth your while looking at. That that contains that whole philosophy of Penrose about working with diagrams and combinatorics. Okay. It's called On Applications of Negative Dimensional Tensors by Roger Penrose. Um, if you can't find it on the internet, uh, write me an email. I'll, I have a PDF. I'll send it to you. Okay. Does it have to do with is somehow a algebraically just including the term so that it becomes multiplic multiplicatively invertible or, or, or does it have higher interpretation as well uh, in terms mm, of um, gender context? I'm sorry, I, I'm not sure I understand your reference about including a term and it being invertible. Oh, when, when you mention negative, negative dimensional uh, I mean, normally when we take oh uh, oh that that 
that yeah, that's yeah. this that if you represent a matrix diagrammatically then it has say lower indices upper indices okay mm -hmm. m m upper i lower j and you want the trace of the matrix then you have to have the i index equal to the j index so you draw a circle right mm -hmm. And then you have a box with a with a with a, a line coming around and back into itself, and that represents the trace of the matrix since we sum over lines that don't have free ends. Mm -hmm. So the trace of a matrix is a loop. Now, in our theory, for example, the the loop, an A loop, has a Chebyshev polynomial as its evaluation. So the Chebyshev polynomials are generalized dimensions. And in Penrose's theory, that was prior to making the generalizations that far, he had negative numbers for his loops. And so he talked about negative dimensional tensors because his loops had negative values. Okay. This... Um... The six J symbol. I mean that that, as far as I recall, is appears a lot in physics, doesn't it? I mean, yeah, that's right. It appears in physics for exactly the reasons that we're talking about. You, you, you can rewrite the the amplitudes for some spin particles interacting in a network of interactions. You can rewrite the amplitude by using the recoupling formula to get a new amplitude, and you can calculate these interactions and so those spin interactions um are important for chemistry in the case of of uh, just ordinary spin in the simplest case in the physics so so there are tables and tables of these kinds of things that are done for the sake of of physical chemistry mm. and penrose had had the happy idea that he could um he could create a, a pre-space time, a background to space time, by having networks of interactions in the abstract that would behave like space time. So he made a theory about that, which is called the spin network theory. And the theory is based on the recoupling ideas. But in the course of that, he, he created a very interesting simplification of the graphical calculi that people had been using for recoupling theory. And then it turns out remarkably that if you just lift his way of doing recoupling theory so that permutation crossings become not theoretic crossings, it turns into the theory that I just described to you. Okay. Um, are there any more questions? I think perhaps we ought to bring the proceedings to a halt now. So uh, thanks again, Lou. And we look forward to next week's talk. Who's talking next week? AG. AG. Okay. And I'll send around a note about that and uh, an abstract. And uh, it'll be at the usual time. Okay. When America has moved forward <laughs> one hour. <laughs> Oh, which means that it'll be an hour later for us. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. And us as well, oddly enough. Well, is time <laughs> change happening this week uh, in the U.S.? Is it... our, our time change happens next weekend. Okay. Okay, so, that's good to know. For... So it'll be the same time in America as it always has been, won't it? Isn't that the whole point? We'll be on standard time, not on summertime. Our summertime ends in November. Okay. Okay, okay folks. So um, thanks again, Lou, and I'll stop now. Okay, thank you.